Hello, I'm Erica Morris, um, and I'm going to present my research project on Lev Vygotsky. Um, he was actually um, an educational psychologist, um, as well as he did some um, stuff in law and some stuff in just regular psychology as well, which I will get into. Um, he was actually born in a city in Russia named Orsha in 1896, um, so born just right before the 1900s. Um, most of his education was actually um, from tutors, um, and then he started to go to a Jewish um, gymnasium school. Um, but while he was growing up, he spent most of his time in the city of Gomel, which is also in Russia. Um, after he went through school, um, he attended Moscow State University. Um, this is actually where he studied law and then graduated in 1917 with his law degree. Um, after returning, or after graduating, he returned back to some of the provinces in Russia. Um, and that is actually where he began to teach um, psychology and some literature. Um, upon teaching there for a few years, um, he was appointed to the Psychology Institute. Um, he actually began to study children with um, physical disabilities as well as learning disabilities. And I think this is where a lot of his um, educational psychology um, comes into play. Um, while he was there, he actually wrote his first essay called The Psychology of Art. Um, it was not published, it was actually not published until 1965, and it, as it comes out, a lot of his research was actually not published until the 1950s. Um, well after he had, he had passed away, most of his research was actually never published or anything like that. Um, he did actually start to turn some of his interests as well into, um, um, educational school settings. Um, where he would go in and um, watch children to see kind of how they learn. And I think that's where he developed a lot of his um, theories that I'll talk about. Um, in 1934, he actually died of um, tuberculosis. Um, once again, that was before a lot of his work was even published. Um, when he passed away, he was actually um, 38 years old, so still fairly young. Um, some of his contributions to early childhood education... Um, his biggest one was probably Zone of Proximal Development. Um, I myself remember reading about this when I was studying for my bachelor's degree. Um, so it's definitely a still a big theory um, going through um, early childhood education or, or any um, childhood education. Um, but Zone of Proximal Development talks about um, where children are um, learning-wise based on what they can do independently with no assistance, um, and then where they are when they have some support from a teacher or even a peer. Um, so he talked about these two things as far as, you know, how ch children learn and what maybe supports they need um, during the class in the classroom. Um, Um, when doing zone of proximal development, um, it is important that the students already know um, what they're able to do independently. Um, and the teachers need to do that as well. Um, the teachers also need to be able to look at measurable skills um, when using zone of proximal development. Um, Vygotsky also talked about with his zone of pro um, proximal development, there was a lower boundary um, which that was what he considered his independent performance. Um, and then he also had his um, upper boundary where it was assisted performance. That once again was talking about um, when there was um, assistance from a, tier, um, a teacher or a peer. Um, Vygotsky also developed the theory of um, cultural historical activity theory. Um, this theory pretty much is just talking about how things in the child's history or hum a human's history, how, they, how it affects their learning later on once they go into school. 
Um, Vygotsky also talked about important tools um, that students can use for higher brain functioning. Um, Vygotsky also believed that by watching a child read, um, the educator or the teacher can see what processes would not normally be seen when like an adult reads. Um, so as a child is tracking, sounding out words, we're able to see many things um, about how a child learns through these processes of them watching them read. Um, once again, Vygotsky also talked about humans needing tools. Um, and these tools kind of help us learn, um, some of which could be considered extensions to human bodies to complete tasks. Um, for lower and those could be like other lower animals would able would use these to also complete tools um, and Vygotsky also believed that mental tools um, were used to help humans um, one example that um, I kind of felt that was easily relatable was using um, your smartphone to write a grocery list so you wouldn't forget things as you were going through the grocery store so you had a list you're able to erase things or check things as you um, got them. Um, Vygotsky also talked about lower mental functions where things that happened with reflex, reflex such as behaviors that can be seen and are able to be measured. Um, higher functions according to Vygotsky were, were more complex processes in, in the brain and obtained through learning and teaching. Um, Vygotsky also came up with uh, mediation um, this is which in which people can connect stimuli by many different links um, in languages. Um, he coined the term inner language, and he believed that language is something that was developed independently. Um, Vygotsky also developed the theory of play. He believed that allowing children to play um, independently without teacher interruption was a big part of them learning. Um, also, he gave guidelines to help um, children or teachers um, facilitate this play, um, that teachers were really not to be involved in the play other than to help settle any um, issues that may arise, any arguments, um, and that kids were supposed to have this dedicated time um, to play and just socialize and learn from playing. Um, a lot of his relevance and significance comes from his zone of proximal development. Um, this is really relevant for teachers today because it, um, it really pushes teachers to know their students as far as, um, you know, what they can do independently versus what they can do, you know, with assistance and teacher assistance. Um, it also pushes the teachers to know um, measurable skills and exactly where they are on that measurable skill percentage-wise to know whether they have met it or if they need more time to work on it. Um, and Vygotsky also talked about, you know, having these teachers at the beginning of each school year to assess students to help determine their zone of proximal development. Um, and I believe that still should be done today in classrooms. Um, this allows the teacher to kind of assess them throughout the year to see if they're making progress to see if interventions need to be in place um, and things like that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was to go back to the theory of play, which Vygotsky also um, commented quite a bit in um, his research. Was, um, and I've seen this a lot in um, pre-K classes. Um, I was a pre-K teacher for several years. Um, and there's actually about 45 minutes to an hour of blocked off time that is just for centers time. Um, and the kids get to explore in different centers with different activities, math activities, art activities. And it's just all through play that they learn to um, socialize, communicate, um, you know, learn new and different things. But that was... Um, you know, Vygotsky's whole idea of theory of play was just dedicating that time for them. Um, that is my report on Lev Vygotsky. Thank you. Have a great night.